Right, so here we go. The Cosmos. For all of human history, mankind has been fascinated by the mysteries of the heavens and what lay beyond the thin blue veil of our atmosphere. Now, in an age of modern science and technology, many of these questions have been answered, but to this day there continues to be several unsolved conundrums. Join me, Endar, as we embark on a fantastic journey to the edge of the solar system, as we uncover the mysteries of our own cosmic backyard. We begin our journey in orbit of our home planet, Earth. A treasure trove of familiar and unfamiliar wonder in a sea of stars. Over billions of years, the dynamics of our solar system have created unique conditions for the appearance of something extraordinary. Life. On Earth, the biotic factors of living organisms and the abiotic factors of mighty mountains and plate tectonics have each played their part in shifting the course of history for the entire planet. Some of the biggest changes to our planet can demonstrate the power of life on Earth. Two billion years ago, the sudden appearance of photosynthesizing cyanobacteria caused a rapid increase of atmospheric oxygen, which was poisonous to most organisms at the time. This oxygen catastrophe, as it is known today, caused a mass extinction, wiping out most of the species of single-celled organisms that inhabited the oceans. It also started to oxidize dissolved iron in the sea, turning the whole world's oceans red for a time. The remains of this period can be seen in deep layers of rock as banded iron formations, which are nowadays mined for iron ore. But this didn't stop life, it only helped it grow. Oxygen levels continued to rise, and because the organisms that were vulnerable to it had been poisoned, only species that could withstand oxygen could live to reproduce even evolving to use it to provide energy through aerobic respiration, natural selection in action. 500 million years ago, a sudden burst of evolution gave rise to complex, multicellular creatures, and throughout many more millions of years, fantastic creatures emerged. During the Carboniferous period 300 million years ago, there was so much oxygen available that the insects grew to giant sizes as they could respire so easily. After the age of the dinosaurs, mammals took the front seat of evolution and dominated the planet, some of whom developing remarkable features such as opposable thumbs and sizable brains, the ancestors of humans. Today we have transcended evolution with our modern medicine and technology, but it's important to remember how special life here is on Earth and that we have a responsibility to protect it. Soon, you will see how terrifyingly inhospitable the rest of the universe is. We set off on our adventure. Our first stop is a short hop away, our own moon. We're by no means the first here. The footprints left by Neil Armstrong during the first lunar landings in 1969 are still imprinted into the moon dust to this day. That's because the moon's barely noticeable exosphere is so thin there's no wind here. Nothing to blow the dust around to scatter it. From here the Earth already looks small as it spins in the dark sky. It doesn't rise or set like the sun because the moon is tidally locked to it, meaning only one side ever faces our home planet. That's why we're so familiar with the appearance of our own moon and our unknown sky. But it also begs the question, what does the far side look like? Thanks to surveys, we have the so-called dark side of the moon extensively mapped, revealing many more impact craters, scars left by meteorite collisions, compared to on the near side. Remarkably, the moon even takes meteorites instead of us, so that the Earth remains safe. Without our moon, tides wouldn't happen, and the Earth's wobble on its axis would be so out of control, leading to unstable weather. We've already got much information about the moon, so let's not stay for too long. Our journey to the edge of the solar system will first take us inwards past planet Venus. Named after the Roman goddess of love, Venus hardly shows any of these qualities. If hell itself was a planet, it would be Venus. As we descend, the atmosphere appears somewhat familiar with towering clouds reminiscent of storms on Earth. However, these are no water clouds. Thick clouds of sulfuric acid cover the whole surface. The ship's instrument indicates that the external temperature and pressure are rising rapidly, quickly going well over one Earth atmosphere, two, three. You should know that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that traps thermal energy in the atmosphere, 
So when I tell you that Venus's thick atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide, you could probably infer as to what's happened here. Due to this and its close proximity to the Sun, Venus is home to an extreme runaway greenhouse effect, with surface temperatures of around 475 degrees Celsius, or 900 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead. It's times like these that I'm glad I invested in unobtainium hull plating. We've landed on the surface. I wouldn't get out if I were you. Even if you could survive the extreme heat, you'd instantly be crushed by the immense atmospheric pressure that's 95 times greater than Earth, equivalent to skinny dipping one kilometre deep in Earth's oceans. Whilst Venus itself is four and a half billion years old, its surface only appears to be half a billion years old, indicating that a catastrophic volcanic resurfacing event took place 500 million years ago, completely repaving the old surface with basaltic lava. Venus remains an incredibly volcanic world. Speaking of lava, there's some heading right for us. So let's move on, shall we? <laughs> if one planet lives up to its namesake, it's Mercury, named after the messenger of the Roman gods. The quickest planet, Mercury takes only 88 days to complete a year due to its close proximity to the Sun. Here, the temperature ranges are phenomenal. With no atmosphere to circulate thermal energy, the day side of the planet reaches temperatures up to 420 degrees Celsius from the intense heat of the nearby sun, whilst the night side can be as cold as minus 170 degrees Celsius in the dark shadow of the smallest planet. Aside from this iron-rich core, there isn't much to do around here since it's so inhospitable. We better swing around the sun to start our journey outwards. Here we reach possibly the most extreme part of our voyage, the Sun. On our journey to its edge we must first understand the centre of our solar system, our own star. At its core, immense gravitational pressure fuses hydrogen into helium, releasing astronomical amounts of energy that balances with gravity, preventing the core from collapsing into itself. Photons travel through the maze of the stellar envelope for millions of years as they are continually scattered by the radiated zone's hydrogen plasma before eventually being emitted as light from the sun's photosphere. Bows of plasma rise from the star, contained inside of incredibly strong magnetic fields, and these prominences sometimes break, ejecting masses of charged particles from the sun's corona. We will ride the solar wind out, past the hottest worlds of the solar system and beyond. Thankfully, the Earth's magnetic field protects us from this radiation, redirecting it away from the planet or to the poles, where it shimmers against the atmosphere and beautiful aurorae. But for another planet, this luxury does not exist. Planet Mars, the fourth planet from the Sun and the first beyond Earth, is believed to have once been a beautiful ocean world, with running rivers and even the potential for life. Nowadays, it is nothing more than a small, lonely, desert world, with iron oxide dust covering the entire planet and giving it its famous red colour. Millions of years ago, when life was only starting to evolve on Earth, the magnetic field protecting the Martian paradise diminished, subjecting the atmosphere to deadly solar wind which slowly swept the gases into outer space. Any remaining water boiled away, with only trace amounts of water ice found in certain parts of the planet nowadays. The atmosphere is almost 50 times thinner than Earth's, and contains mostly carbon dioxide, making breathing impossible and sound quiet and muffled. Despite being named after the Roman god of war, don't expect an invasion by Martians anytime soon. However, the great achievement of NASA's Ingenuity helicopter showed that powered flight is indeed possible on this unbreathable world, demonstrating that with enough effort, we can overcome these problems. In fact, here in the future, we already have. If I wasn't on such a tight schedule, I'd show you the Olympus Mons Mountain Resort, but oh well, we can climb the highest volcano in the solar system another time. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. Merely captured asteroids, these potato-shaped moons are tiny, and are only bright dots in the Martian night sky. It's predicted that millions of years in the future, the closest moon Phobos will stray too close and be ripped apart by tidal forces from the red planet, turning it into a beautiful, shimmering ring around planet Mars.
travelling beyond Mars, we might have a slight navigational hazard. Well, maybe not. The asteroid belt is nothing like you see in the movies. Those depictions are much more reminiscent of a planetary ring system. Shepherded by the powerful gravity of Jupiter, there are billions of asteroids ranging in size from tiny specks of dust to countryside space rocks, and even one failed world, the dwarf planet of Ceres. However, from here the nearest neighbour will be no more than a speck in the sky, indistinguishable from the field of stars without longer periods of observation to see their movement. The asteroids are believed to be the remains of the protoplanetary disk where the planets formed billions of years ago while the sun was still young. Some are rich in precious metals, making them an optimum site for future mining if the technology can be developed and cost lowered. Oh wait, this is the future, isn't it? Hey, would you look at the radar? It seems like these space pirates want all the platinum. We better get out of here. Well, moving onwards, we come across more asteroids? We are out of the asteroid belt, how come? Oh, we're 60 degrees behind Jupiter in its orbit. These must be the Trojans. Fancy schmancy gravitational shenanigans between the powerful masses of Jupiter and the Sun create five semi-stable points in empty space that an object can just chill around without falling. These are known as the Lagrange points, labelled L1 to L5, the latter of which we are currently located at. Here, rogue asteroids collect, creating small asteroid clusters known as Trojans, preceding and trailing Jupiter in its orbit. Earth has similar albeit weaker points too, with two permanent asteroids detected so far. However, the L1 and L2 points are used by many spacecraft, including the James Webb Space Telescope, as they can be positioned safely away from Earth and interference from its atmosphere for more detailed observation. We better catch up with Jupiter now though. That was the sound of the Jovian bow shock. Jupiter's powerful magnetic field ploughs through supersonic solar wind like the bow of a ship, creating a shockwave of plasma as the solar wind halts. We've entered the magnetic field. From here, you should be able to see the Galilean moons, in order of size, Ganymede, Callisto, Io and Europa. These were the first moons of any other planet to be observed, and are each interesting in their own right. Europa is a cold ice world, though tidal forces from Jupiter may churn up its insides, creating enough heat for a liquid ocean to exist beneath the ice, an ideal spot for life to exist. Callisto is dark and icy and covered in many craters, and Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system, even larger than planet Mercury. Io is the innermost of the Galilean moons and is a terrifying volcanic world covered in volcanoes, resulting from the strong tidal churning from the giant planet orbits so closely. Named after the king of the Roman gods, and rightly so, Jupiter is the largest and possibly most influential planet in the solar system. The fifth planet from the Sun with a mass of 300 Earths, it is so large that every other planet could fit inside it with room to spare. Well, more at hollow, of course. Jupiter is gas giant. It has no surface, only an atmosphere of hydrogen that increases in density the lower you go. Powerful winds create terrifyingly strong vortices, such as the Great Red Spot, a storm that at one point was three times the size of the entire Earth, raging but slowly shrinking for over 300 years. The chaotic clouds form distinct bands, and due to high internal pressures compressing carbon, may actually rain diamonds! In the centre is believed to be an Earth-sized rocky core, however we may never know for certain. Before we leave, Jupiter has one last secret to be seen. Turning back, passing through the mighty planet's shadow, faint rings can be seen. You're probably thinking about another world when it comes to rings though.
Saturn, with its majestic ring system, is possibly the most beautiful planet in our solar system. The second largest planet is a lot less dense than the other giants, so much so that if you had a swimming pool large enough, it would float. Or at least that's what everyone says. I might test it for myself if I can get my hands on a world engine. Anywho, the seven rings of Saturn are composed of rock and ice, some chunks as large as houses. Perhaps the remains of a moon that strayed too close. There's a gap bigger than the one between my teeth in this one, and if you look closely, you can see Pan, one of the shepherd moons. That big mound around its equator is just big ring bits it picked up. Looks like a mini Saturn, eh? And over there is Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Hidden beneath a thick atmosphere of nitrogen, the surface temperatures are so cold that lakes and rivers of liquid methane flow across this barren world. Titan is the only known moon to have a substantial atmosphere, and it could potentially be a home to exotic life if the conditions are just right. Hey, speaking of moons, that's no moon. Oh wait, it's just Mimas. Yes, one of Saturn's moons looks just like the Death Star. If the impactor that created that huge crater was any bigger, it would have completely shattered Mimas and possibly formed a new ring around Saturn. Though now some of my colleagues want to turn it into a planet death ray, so it might be a good idea to move on now. Here things are starting to get a little chilly. We're almost 3 billion kilometers from the sun, or 20 times the distance from the Earth is from the sun. Just ahead of us is Uranus, the first and slightly larger of the two ice giants. Uranus is so big, 60 Earths could fit inside of it. Something quite odd, however, is its angle of rotation. If you can tell by the rings, the whole planet is on its side. It's believed that another planetoid rammed into Uranus millions of years ago, knocking it off its axis and giving it its abnormal tilt. Orbiting Uranus in the same plane as its rings and rotation, Miranda is a moon covered in scars and ridges. Some believe the entire moon was once destroyed in a collision, only for the fragments to recoalesce into a spheroid once again, resulting in the scars you see today. As we move onwards towards Neptune, we reach the beginning of the edge of the solar system. The eighth furthest planet from the Sun, Neptune is also an ice giant. Don't be confused, there's still gas giants made of hydrogen gas, just a lot colder. Neptune has the strongest winds in the entire solar system, reaching speeds of up to 1,200 miles per hour. Nearby, there is the moon Triton, the coldest of the cold. Triton is the coldest moon in the solar system, with average temperatures of minus 235 degrees Celsius, allowing it to be covered in nitrogen ice and strangely orbits in the opposite direction to the rest of Neptune's moons and rings, suggesting it wasn't formed with Neptune, but originated in the further parts of the solar system before being captured by Neptune's gravity. More isolated planetoids like Triton we shall soon see. Beyond Neptune, we enter the Kuiper Belt. Here lies countless short-period comets waiting to re-enter the inner solar system at the aphelions of their hundred-year elongated orbits, and many more icy planetoids. One you've undoubtedly heard of is the dwarf planet Pluto. Not much was known about it until it was visited by the New Horizons spacecraft in 2015, which revealed its heart of ice for the first time, showed its moon Charon in detail, and even discovered something truly remarkable, even this far from the sun. Pluto has an atmosphere. Pluto was once considered the ninth planet, but when the discovery of several more small worlds like it in the Kuiper Belt caused scientists to question the very definition of a planet, it was decided that a planet was an object massive enough to clear its orbit of any other space rocks, something that little planet Pluto could not. Thus, Pluto and many other frozen worlds were reclassified as dwarf planets. Don't let the name discourage you though, as these worlds hide their own secrets, perhaps even pointing to something much more mysterious lurking in the outer reaches of our solar system. Much further in the outer reaches of the Kuiper Belt lies a dark, reddish planetoid called Sedna. What seemed like an ordinary dwarf planet discovery turned into a stark realisation that many other KBOs had similar, elongated, highly eccentric orbits. They don't just form like that. So what influenced them to be like this? These anomalous orbits are the strongest pieces of evidence for the existence of a massive object, 
some six times the mass of the Earth, silently orbiting the sun beyond the Kuiper Belt. Could it be a ninth planet? A faint red dwarf star indistinguishable from the background points of light? Perhaps even a primordial black hole that formed an instant after the Big Bang? The question remains unanswered for now, though one day intelligent minds will solve this conundrum. Could it be you? Any wants to the Onwards! We are nearing the edge of the solar system. Plasma instruments detect that the solar wind is now subsonic. We have reached the termination shock. Soon we will exit the region of the sun's influence known as the heliosphere, where the solar wind propels plasma outwards, and the sun's strong magnetic field blocks interstellar cosmic plasma. And here we are. The direction of plasma movement has changed. We have passed through the heliopause and are now technically in interstellar space. Some will say we have passed beyond the edge of the solar system, although the force of gravity still plays its part on objects even this far out. At 2,000 times the distance of the Earth to the Sun, we have reached the Oort Cloud, a swarm of freezing long-period comets nuclei around the Sun, taking millions of years to complete a single orbit. If another star were to pass through here, it would dislodge millions of space rocks and send them hurtling into the inner solar system, as is believed to have been the case during the late heavy bombardment some 4 billion years ago. And this truly is the edge of the solar system. Beyond the Oort cloud, the sun's gravity is insignificant. Nothing is gravitationally bound to it anymore. And anything past the heliopause is part of the interstellar medium. We are now in true interstellar space orbiting the supermassive black hole in the centre of the galaxy. Just take a moment and appreciate the emptiness. Less than one speck of dust per million cubic metres of space. No stars for light years. No sunlight to illuminate anything flying through this cold void. Bored yet? Me too. Let's head back. Alright, thanks for watching guys, this has been a great video to make, something a bit different from usual, and I really do hope you've enjoyed it. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, remember to subscribe, and if you want to see more like this, let me know in the comments down below. So, as always, I'll see you all later, and are out!